saying to Helen, I think it was yesterday, how, you know, you prepare a passage of scripture and you've pre been preaching on the Bible for like 30 years, and <laughs> say it quickly, it doesn't sound so bad, and then you're in a passage of scripture and you see something, you think, why did I never see that before? Yeah? Maybe you're going to say, no, that was obvious, Simon, we're bored. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But I've, I, I want to just give thanks to God, really. I've had that experience again this week, and it's quite miraculous. Week. And you might think, what are you talking about? Um, but there we are. If you do, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so think about the work of the kingdom of God, right? How do we think of it? We think of it, don't we? Like catching fish, you know? Jesus goes by the seashore and he says to those fishermen, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they're all sort of pretty manly lads. They go, Yeah, hunting! Yeah, it's hunting, yeah, it's fishing somewhere else. So you can talk to the, the guys in the mart and, and they go, on a bad day, you know, they go away. Sorry about a bit of grief. No mind, we are in hella, I go hunting. <laughs> That's it. Or well, they've had a domestic at home. We are in hella, I'm going hunting. Um, How true that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We see it as, oh, no, hang on, thank you for that. It's a word of encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, so we get out the. We go out and we cast the net. And we go out and we cast the net by telling things to people. And we expect to just then drag the net back in the boat full. Yeah? Strenuous efforts made. You go out, you throw out your net, you tell them, and then you bring the net back in. And after strenuous effort, we're often desperate and disappointed in the morning, the way these guys fishing in the Sea of Galilee were that morning when Jesus found them. We often personally don't get fed in this process. We often don't get close to Christ in the process. We often actually don't take the work of the kingdom of God forward in that process. Because we've got this fishing model for what we're doing. We're here in the boat, right? Now we're just going to go out there with the net, we're going to chuck it about a bit, and we're going to pull it back into our boat. And we feel happy, safe and secure. That's the model. Now, of course, the initial call to those followers of Jesus, not that word initial, back in Matthew 4, was to follow Christ and to become fishers of men. But that's when they start following Christ. And what that following of Christ should have done is to change them, to make them new men with different thoughts and, and feelings and attitudes and priorities in life. Therefore, men with a different way of doing things, you know, being a Christian and, and growing in grace means we end up with a different way of doing things. It should have changed them. It should have changed their attitude to what they do and how they do what they do. So my big idea this morning is this. We've neglected the model that Jesus sets out for the people doing that work of the kingdom of God. People who are going out doing the work of the kingdom of God, they're to go fishing like shepherds. Yeah, I know. It does make you out of it. He's the good shepherd, Right? Shepherds feed sheep. They lead sheep out and they feed them. And they nurture them and they care for them. And it's a nuisance and it's a pain. And the sheep knock you over. So this time of year they're under you. go over the back in the field this time of year and they're after you. And you know, you've got trouble standing up sometimes. Shepherds feed sheep. And if you follow the good shepherd, here's your model. We're here feeding sheep. He's just been doing that as Jesus for his followers because he says, come over, there's breakfast. And he's commissioning his followers to feed sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. He's commissioning them to do that because they are following him and he is the great shepherd and his business is drawing together and feeding sheep. You go into a field at the moment with a bag of food and you've got sheep. They're all around you, you can't move for them. And he's going to go on as Jesus to commission his followers to go out into the world to carry the work of the kingdom of God forward in his absence. And to do that by catching fish? No. To do that by making disciples, feeding sheep. The way he's modelled that process to them. How has he modelled that process to them? He's just invested his life in them for the last three and a half years. Going with them, teaching them, questioning them, feeding them into faith and closer following of Jesus. 
He's been investing his life in them. It seems more than possible the dominant model for how Jesus wants the kingdom of God taken forward in his absence is that of leading sheep out to pasture and feeding them day by day, hungry sheep, rather than furtively creeping up on fish at night and capturing them by dragging them into your boat with a net. Can you see the difference? And how would that change what we're doing? <laughs> Fishing, these guys knew, you know? Fishing they did, they were comfortable with it. There they are, after his resurrection, after all the traumatic events of, you know, crucifixion and resurrection. There they are with some certainty that I'm going to fish in. It's what I know. It's what I do. It's what I find easy to do. And Jesus says, yeah, you fishermen, you're going to be shepherds. What? Shepherds? Chiyoki. I'm going to do that. Shepherds the lowest of the low as well. In Old Testament times? Yeah. But unlike most of the leaders of God's people to date, Jesus is now starting with fishermen, not shepherds. And he said, I'm taking you and I'm making shepherds of you. It is more peculiar, isn't it? Now, before we all get legal and self-critical, let's not forget how gracious Jesus is being in calling specifically Peter to this at this point, at this moment. John 21, 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. Who's just caught them? Well, anyway. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. Full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not tall. And Jesus says, then come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And when Jesus came took the bread, gave it to them, did the same to the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. He made them fire. He provided the fish to their labour. Now they get to start off the day after a long difficult night feeding in the presence of Jesus. He does it for them before calling them to the arduous and difficult task of doing it for others. This is what you're doing, I'm showing you. And they, Peter in particular, certainly don't deserve it at this moment. They've been tired and frustrated. And Jesus performs this gracious, this merciful service of inviting tired, frustrated night workers to breakfast. They've been fishing. They've proved to be rubbish at it. They're not happy about that. And it was the carpenter who had resolved their <clears throat> professional deficit. You rubbish at your job. And it would have been easy for him to have said, there's your fish, your failed fisherman, your muppets, now go and cook, cook a few of those fish for your own breakfast. But he says, come and have breakfast with me. Come and have breakfast with me. His nature is to draw needy people to himself. Frustrated. Hungry. Cold, wet, tired. Come and have breakfast with me. That's the saviour we're following, and that's the way he wants his kingdom taken forward. Feeding sheep. It's a very different process from catching fish. Follow that model. And he makes you fishes of men because the end result is fishing boat. So here's the model demonstrated, verses 9 to 14, and then the model talks to Peter, verses 15 to 19. Maybe Peter in particular, because he's the most driven type A personality amongst them, the least likely to get this message unless he sees it and hears all of this. I hear regularly now keen young men in pioneering ministries talking about that they use such military metaphors for what they do. And Jesus is saying, look, the process goes like this, let's go feed some sheep. Perhaps, perhaps I'm one of that elite band who've had the privilege of feeding, you know, four-legged sheep before I get to preach about this this morning. Trust me, when we go out with a net, fish try to avoid us. When you walk into a field this morning with a bag of feed, sheep flock to you. 
Let's look then at the model that Jesus offers for getting folks into fellowship with himself. He feeds these fatigued followers. That's three acts in one sentence. Can you just spot that? He feeds his fatigued followers. He firstly addresses their failure, their shortages, and their frustration. He provides them with fish. And then he encourages their heart with a fire and fellowship and an invitation to breakfast. And those are the two points in my sermon. Firstly, feeding the fatigued followers. He has a fireside. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Come to breakfast. Here's a fire. Come and get warm. Come and get dry. Here was a source of comfort to, to bring the rigours of the night and the cold, the wet they'd been experiencing to a close. Don't forget, they'd been out in the environment on the lake all night. They'd been on an open boat all night on a lake. And they just got wet pulling in nets, because you can't pull in nets without getting wet. I learned that when I was a little lad, you know, helping them. Tidy, the, the, the tidy estuary salmon fishermen with their nets, right? You couldn't, I'd come over and I'd say, you're soaking wet! Yeah, I know I'm soaking wet, I've been pulling in nets. If you pull in nets, you get wet. And they've been out there in the night, in the cold, in the wet. And Peter, at least, is completely wet through, because as soon as he recognised the Lord, Peter put his warm, dry overcoat on and jumped into the lake to be with the Lord. Remember that bit? Yeah. I've often thought about this on cold... Hard days on the on the mart or on a, on a stand somewhere with something for the church or whatever. I, I often thought, yeah, I'm standing there giving out literature, and they, they don't want literature. What they want is a warm. And perhaps the best way to draw a crowd for our open air might be to set up an oil drum and light the fire. Jesus has lit a fire on the beach. He's looking after people. It's the prerequisite of drawing together his flock. Here's a fire. Now we think of fire from the pulpit as fire and brimstone preaching, don't we? And we're back to nets there. <laughs> That's not the sort of ministry Christ is modelling here. He's warming their bodies with his fire before warming their hearts with his fellowship. And that's the way it works. How do you feel when you come in from the cold and you've had a good warm? How do you feel when you come into this building in the winter and it's cold? You're just Bursting to hear the sermon, aren't you? You're not. Jesus says here's the fire. And it's the prerequisite to feeding their souls. Worked hard all night. Got nothing for their efforts. Tough night after a traumatic few weeks. Jesus is doing their bodies and their hearts good by giving them breakfast. Use fish, use fresh fish. Pleasing to the senses, nourishing the body around the fire on the beach. Now that the sun's come up. They can't listen to his teaching when their bodies are cold and their tummies are rumbling. Incidentally, we don't, you know, so often when food is distributed to the needy and whatever, they, they have to listen to the sermon first. You only get the food if you listen to the sermon. There's something wrong with the sermon then, isn't there? Jesus feeds the body and then he feeds their souls. First he takes care of their need of comfort and nutrition, then that leads him into deeper fellowship with himself. See, fireside, fish, fellowship. Fire should, fire, there's all F's in it. Where are all these F's coming from? Fellowship. Spiritual fellowship with Jesus takes place again around meeting physical needs, warmth and food. And again, for Jesus, a shared meal is so much more than just eating. Food is very much more than just fuel. It's fellowship. Now, of course, <coughs> got to get the balance right here. These disciples had heard the message of Jesus because they've been travelling along and eating with him for ages. And it's definitely the truth that sets you free. Right? We, do not, we do not diminish that to any extent whatsoever. But how do you communicate that message? Jesus comes along with a message. But it's a message handled not with the attitude and demeanour of dragging fish into a boat with a net, but with the demeanour of the disciple-maker feeding the bodies and the souls of Christ's sheep. 
he solved their fishlessness. Right? There was all this load of fish on the right hand side where they should have been able to see it, they couldn't, and it was there, and now it was daylight, and they caught them anyway. He solved their fishlessness. He's banished their frustration with miraculous but practical help. He's warmed them because they're cold and wet. And he's fed their hungry bodies. And then he's shared with them his time, his personality, his fellowship. He gave them time. His time. And when he did so, they recognised their God in this Jesus. What does it say here in verse 12? Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. So here's the question. How do we do that for people? Because he's how he wants the kingdom of God taken forward throughout the time of his physical absence. He's telling us here it is. That, that's why his last words to his followers on earth, Matthew 28, 17, following came to be these. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. The bottom line is this, if you, if you lay out food, if you draw people together, if you disciple and fellowship and, and deal with people on this basis, that's the way I want my work taken forward. That is so much more than gathering together sermon fodder, isn't it? If you lay out food, you will draw sheep. And here's my second point. Jesus does it by feeding the fatigued followers and then he commissions his people to go feed sheep. Peter. Failure, Peter, at this point. He wasn't the only one. There were others who'd been scattered, let Jesus down, run away. But as ever, Peter had been doing it large. He does everything large. Yeah? So imagine him at McDonald's. <laughs> well, everything's large, right? And extra chips. So how is the Lord going to get closure on this issue? And set up Peter and the others listening to, to what he's saying. How is he going to get those guys who are feeling guilty to carry forward the future work of the cause of the kingdom of God? Three questions. Pretty straightforward question. First question, verse 15. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Please listen, Peter. Peter had been the first into the tomb, do you remember? Peter and John ran. John got there first, but Peter went straight in because he's that sort of guy. Peter had been first into the water when he realised it was Jesus standing there on the beach. He'd been first back to get the fish from the boat to cover the increased guest list at breakfast that Jesus is bidding. Bring some fish, Peter went. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? No, Peter, no doubt Peter thought that he did. But did he? Lord, if all fall away, I will not fall away, he said to Jesus at that last supper. I would. Peter's only got one possible answer, and here's his first answer in verse 15. Only one possible answer he can really go for in that public setting. Peter sidesteps the comparative nature of the question more than these elements. Because if he included that, it would be a terrible faux pas in front of everybody else. You know that I love you. What did Jesus know? Jesus knew Peter had denied him three times when the cock crowed. And whatever Peter was saying, he seems likely to have known actually what was in Peter's heart at this point in time. And the Lord will therefore put the question three times to Peter. But with really quite significant variations. Please... Please notice these two issues here. Two issues. The words that Jesus uses have been strongly debated and still are in the commentaries. The first question that he asks. Agapasme pleon tuto. 
Do you love me more than the others? Do you love me in that agape way more than these? More than these. Hang on, I'm going to come back to a few things. More than these. Which? These being which? The fish? The other disciples? What? More than what? Do you love me more than what? Now if the question was about fish, it was pretty easy to see. Peter had been much more concerned to get to Jesus himself than take care of a miraculously large catch of fish because he put in his coat and jumped in the drink. Yeah? If the question were about the other disciples, that would sit well in this context, both of Peter's constant desire to outstrip the others in his devotion to Jesus, and the context of his earlier denials of the Lord when the pressure was on. I'm going for that. It's more than these other disciples. But then, and this is the second issue, Peter chooses a, a different word entirely about the love me part of Jesus' question when he makes his answer. Because Peter says, Jesus asked him, do you agape me? And, and Peter says, Lord, you know that I feel I say, I, I brotherly love you. So here's that question. It finds point in the way the words that Jesus uses to question Peter's life seem to go through a bit of a downgrade. There, there are things to be said, but let's not try and jump that gun. The answer here from Peter, whether the word choice makes any difference or not, sidesteps the relative question, more than these, and it sidesteps the choice of that word for love. The question is, is there any significance in that at all? The second time round, here comes the question. Again, verse 16, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now look, Jesus has dropped the comparative. He's not asking more than these anymore, is he? He's saying, do you love me? And he's still using that agape word. Never mind the more than these, but do you agape me anyway? And it strikes me the Saviour's choice of words is going to be relevant in this context, this context. Especially given the answer that Peter offers, because the second answer to that second question goes like this. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, verse 16. Lego to ne kurie su oidas ot hoti philo. So he's saying, I philo you. No, I'm not saying I agape you. I philo you. Jesus has lowered the bar. By dropping the comparative element in the question, but Peter's response still hasn't moved. He's still filioing Jesus, right? That other word for love. Which wasn't the word in Christ's question. Is that relevant? It's the word of human brotherly love, boys together. But, but it isn't the word that gets used distinctly, distinctively of the, the, the sort of mutual love that God is a part of. Now here comes the third question, oh boy. Verse 17, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he's, he's changed his word. Jesus has changed the word he's using. He's got the Peter, the rock. <laughs> he's, he's definitely not saying Peter, rock, rocky, but he's actually, you see, rocky, I know a point is made with that, can I deal with it? Okay. Um, the thing about that is, if you're saying to somebody informally, you use his nickname. This is the problem, because actually Jesus is charging him quite formally. Simon, son of John. Right. So, if uh, we've got puppies running around at the moment, and if we're chatting and whatever to, to Bron, I'll say, Bron, Bron, but if she'd been naughty, they'd Bron when? Right? Because it's a more formal pattern of address, and she hears it in the voice. So, maybe, maybe, I don't know about that one, maybe. The third time, definitely. Simon, son of John, do you fill out on me? Okay. I, I reckon there's meaningful word choice right here at the heart of this third question. It's not there in the English, but in the Greek, Jesus now also gives up on the agape. And he settles the question of Peter's phileo. Now I know, trust me, I know the clever commentators say that in other Greek literature, there isn't a big distinction between the words phileo and agape. I know as far as the dictionary is concerned, that's what the modern scholars say. But here, in this context, and if context is the clue to meaning, there's something going on. There's something going on. And it's pushing coincidence too hard as far as I'm concerned to think that Jesus isn't choosing his words very purposefully here. Listen to that third answer from Peter. 
it says Peter was hurt by Jesus' choice of words. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter just can't seem to get beyond Philo to Agape. But finally, Jesus is going to settle, as he has done with all of us who follow him, for less than the standard he has a right to demand. Wait a minute. Jesus is settling for less from Peter and still commissioning Peter to go feed sheep. That's huge, isn't it? Because we often feel, I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I can't. Mm, uh, and Jesus is saying to Peter, you're not. But my grace is sufficient for you, as he said to Paul later, because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Go feed sheep. I'll let you feed my sheep. Go feed my sheep. We're ever going to go on to serve the purpose of God in the generation that we've been called into to push forward the kingdom of God, it'll be because Jesus settles for us with our inadequacy, in our deficits, with our failures, with our lack, and still sends us off not to combat enemies or capture fish, but to work at drawing together by feeding those who are already his sheep. Does that make sense? Hmm. Jesus has just done this for them. That's the thing. He's just drawn them to himself by feeding them. And they are to be his authentic followers. They must take care of his sheep. How? He tells us how. Now a good friend has recently, this morning, has tweeted at the heart of his sermon, which says, what we do basically is almost irrelevant. What we need is for God to work. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm going to work when you do this. And everything in that tweet made for my friend wanting to say, Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, it's laborers labor in vain. And that is true. But there's more to say. Go feed my sheep. I've fed you, says Jesus. How have I fed you? Have I come roaring along with a big old net, throwing it over you and dragged you into my boat? No. That's the process, but don't imagine that's the method. That's what we're going to achieve here, but don't imagine that's the way you think of it, with all your, your hunting metaphors and all your furtiveness and sneaking up and <laughs> dragging away. Ooh, don't push the metaphor that hard, says Jesus. This is how we're going to do it. Take care of my sheep. Who are his sheep? They are the ones, according to John chapter 10, which has gone before, who know his voice, who listen to his voice, and who, like the rest of his people, follow him when they hear his voice. Because he feeds them. They are his sheep. And how is God's kingdom taken forward? By finding those people who are his sheep, one by one, drawing them by his voice to follow Jesus, and feeding and caring for them as they move with us along his way. It's all about shepherd and sheep from now on. Not just numbers of fish that can get dragged up in a net. There's one more thing. Just see if you can spot what it is. <clears throat> do, do you ever speak to a young Christian and say, After all, you 
Apostle Paul can say, be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. For all of us do follow people, whether we like it or not, consciously or unconsciously, we do. that are learned as much by example as by word. Is that why we pray and work to train up Christian parents? It's not just what the parents say, it's what they do. Watch me. So if you're looking around for a good senior mentor, then always ask some fundamental questions. Don't simply say, oh, that person seems to be making a real goal and wonderful success. Just love that personality. Like to be like that. No, ask some fundamental questions. You know all about my teaching. Does he follow apostolic teaching, Paul's teaching? way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, sufferings, do you see? Choose your mentors, and then hold the right mentors in high regard. So in a world where there are so many false ideas, or deceptive ideas, or selfish ideas, un-God, anti-God ideas. What do you do to get orientated toward God himself? Well, you go to his word. You hold on to the Bible. You're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. So you need to think God's thoughts after him. Isn't that what Paul says? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that means you must hold on to the Bible. Not as a magic book, but as a book that teaches you how to think, what to think. There is this teaching ministry, whether in our home or in small groups or with our children or one-on-one -on -one across the back fence or around the coffee urn at work, and, and, and then in evangelistic Bible studies and adult Bible classes, whatever, constantly, constantly teaching and preaching the Word of God. How else shall we respond to this world that is going off in its own and other directions. How else will, should, 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 should we prevail in the last days? We hold out the word to others. personally costly. Because, okay, Jesus has said, go feed my sheep, go feed my sheep, go feed my sheep, follow this model I've got for you, feed sheep, do like this. But this is really quite an interesting prophecy, Jesus then tops it all off with about Peter. In verse 18, John chapter 21, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. 
When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now we know Peter is a little bit longer in the tooth than some of the other disciples present there on that day. So the reference to the carefreeness of his youth is something that's going to grasp Peter's attention straight away. When you're young, you can do what you like. And you get to a certain age when you look back on that. When you were younger, you dressed yourself, went where you wanted. Peter, you're not young anymore. But don't expect an old age lived easily outside the spiritual conflict. We kind of imagine that's the way it's going to be. Peter, you're not young anymore, but don't expect it to go easy and to retire. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. What's that about stretching out your hands? Doesn't that sound odd? And how does that predict? How is that a prediction of the kind of death by which Peter is going to glorify God? What on earth is that referring to? Someone else dressing you, leading you where you don't want to go. What's that about? Well, Carson in his commentary, his heavy, clever commentary on John, not this little video, uh, he points out that phrase about stretching out the hands is widely used to refer to crucifixion. What an odd order. They stretch out the hands, crucifixion, so that they could be, ah, oh, here we go, tied to the crossbeam. That would be fixed on to the stake at the place of crucifixion. Hands stretched out, and they're going to dress you with the beam of your cross. And then they're going to lead you away to the place where feeling his sheep it's going to cost you your life. So Jesus did say this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then immediately he reissued that invitation that began Jesus' saving relationship with Peter way back in the earliest days, beside that same Sea of Galilee where they're having their early morning breakfast. You know what it's going to cost? Now come and follow me. See, by now Peter has been completely reinstated. Completely recommissioned. Retreaded as a disciple, right? So, can you see then why I think it's a mistake to see this passage as simply telling us how Jesus forgave Peter? Oh yeah, Jesus forgave Peter. Jesus is working with faulty goods. When he's working with you and me, he's working with faulty goods. And he takes faulty goods and he says, right, go change the world, feed my sheep. The passage at the end of John's record of the risen Lord Jesus does something so important. It shows how Jesus wants his kingdom taken forward. When he's now only got failures to be doing that for him, now he's gone back to glory. How does he do that? Jesus does it by tolerating fools gladly. There he is doing it. He does it by tolerating our blatantly inadequate love for him. There he was doing it on that beach. He does it by forgiving and restoring failures that he cares for, by curing their frustrations, addressing their daily failures, comforting and warming them with his bonfire, feeding them and banishing their hunger with his breakfast, and drawing them not simply to his message, capturing them in his net, dragging them gasping out of their environment into his boat, Fundamentally laying down food, drawing them into his personal fellowship, bringing them close in to his friendship. And Jesus calls, first of all, calls you and me, failures, to draw close into him, to get the breakfast on the beach. And then, by his means and his method, to extend welcome to failures like we are, because it is actually a lot about the way we do it. Yeah, unless God steps in, unless God brings people to faith, no, no chance that we're going to do anything. Of course. But he has a method as well as a message. Because the method is tied up in the message. And embodies it. 
what it's actually about. He welcomes failures like we are into his personal fellowship. And he says, go about proclaiming that by this means of welcoming hungry, frustrated, disillusioned, cold, wet people into fellowship with you and breakfast on the beach. And here's how we've got into all the world to make his disciples. He's the God who turns furtive fishermen into warm-hearted feeders of sheep.